Hi everybody, I'm here to, uh, to present to you a project that we are now uh, doing in Ghent, which is called Adam, and Adam means breathe in, uh, in English, or, um, well, as a verb. Um, and this project is a project from Timelab, um, and it's, uh, well, the purpose of the project is to, uh, to monitor the the, the air quality in Ghent. Well, the project doesn't have to be in Ghent, but because it's a local project, uh, we're focusing on Ghent, but obviously what we're doing applies everywhere. Um, so it's made in time-lap, as I said, and what is time-lap? Time-lap is something like a, a fab lab. Um, but it's not just a fab lab, it's uh, actually, it's a uh, it's a place where people can work together, can learn from each other, but it's mostly um, focused on artists. So it allows artists to implement things that they, that they think of, that they, the creative people, the, what they want to do, they can do it at Timelab and people with more technical knowledge can help them uh, realize their projects. But obviously it also attracts technical people like me. Uh, because you, you have things like a laser printer, uh, 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 yeah, 3D, 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, CNC uh, machines, um, and, and a lot of people that know how to use them or can help you with those things. Uh, it was founded in 2010. It's located, obviously, in the beautiful city of Ghent. And, um, well, as I said, it's a facilitator for makers and uh, to collaborate, share knowledge. Um, it also does uh, projects like the Adam project, so different projects surrounding different teams, and uh, the Adam project is one of them. And the nice thing about these projects is that it's not just the technical side, which I'm presenting now, but there are also people thinking about marketing the, the, the project, or people thinking about how are we going to design the box. Huh? The, um, so, so also the, the, the product development people, we have people that think about um, how to uh, work together with other, uh, with other organizations to maybe elevate what we are doing um, by, by working together. So it's not just technical people, you have different teams in the Adam project that take care of different, uh, different things that are necessary to make this a successful project. Um, well, Timelab also does workshops and boot camps and also invites uh, artists to stay at Timelab. They have some facilities where people can, can live and they stay and they stay for uh, multiple months to, to work on their projects. Um, it is um, sponsored by uh, the Flemish government and the city of Ghent. That's how they can do these things, obviously. Um, so. That's Timelab. And the Adam project, which is one of the projects that Timelab is doing, um, as I said, it's what we want to do is we want to collect and share this uh, real-time quality of, of, of the air um, throughout the city. Um, why are we doing this? I will, I will come back to that. But uh, how are we doing it? It's a device uh, that collects, in this, in this phase, we're only collecting fine dust. So particulate matter, um, because it represents air pollution the best, we think. Uh, and we have to focus on, on something first. Uh, and the, the, the idea is that we push the data that we collect throughout the city, uh, we centralize it, and we, do, we, we work on this data to, to uh, improve the quality of the data centrally. Um, it's a community-driven project. We work only with volunteers. Um, and as I said, we have different teams. So we have a team that is thinking of uh, how to do campaigns, how to make people, people more aware of the, the air quality in the city. Um, it's open hardware, open software, open data. Uh, and uh, we try to create a community around this team. So a lot of people come to our, uh, to our meetings that we have once a month where we uh, tell them what the status is of the project and what we're doing. Now, the problem with, with air quality is that um, in Ghent we have two, in, in the city, in the center of Ghent, we have two um, air quality space stations that, that measures different times of pollution. Um, and the problem with that is that it's possible that these machines say that the air quality is good, but where you live, 
where you are breathing the air, the quality could be not so good. And so it's like if you go into a nuclear site, you have to wear those, um, how is it called? The Batches. Yeah, it's, you, you, you have this monitoring device that, that uh, monitors the nuclear uh, radiation. And so it's only, um, it's important that where you are at that time, moment in time, what you breathe in, that's the only measure that, that, is, that is relevant to you. So it doesn't matter that there's somewhere in, in, in Ghent is a, a monitoring station. They are often placed on, in locations where the air quality is much better than what we what we know is uh, is the case so yeah we have to monitor where we are and that information is simply not available um, the other problem with with air quality is that you have these uh, norms that you you the, the world health organization has some some norms um, the europe has some norms that if you go over this this amount um, then it's bad for your health, but obviously these norms are um, decided based on both the industry and, and politicians. It's lobbied to get those norms. And for instance, for Europe, for uh, fine dust, what they said is the first 35 uh, measurements during the day, so the, f the, the, the first 35 daily measurements are not taken into account. So they only take the 36th and above they take into account for air quality, which is really strange. I don't know how they got to that, but you can have 35 days at a very high uh, air quality, uh, but in this case, fine dust, and then only the 36 day counts. <laughs> so it's, it's really strange that, uh, that these things exist. So now why is this important or why is it important to us? This is, um, this is the a map of uh, Europe, obviously, and here you can see you have to take care that this is based on data from 2000. Uh, so it's older data. There is not that, not a lot of information available. Uh, I think there is there are some uh, some numbers from 2010 as well, but they are not that detailed. But this is for ho the whole of Europe, and you can see where we live in Ghent. It's rather dark, and. In this map, they, they say the loss of life expectancy. This is from a Euro, European uh, uh, research paper. Um, the, the loss of, of life expectancy in 2000, with, based on the, the, the air pollution in 2000, on, based on fine dust, so particular matter 10, I will come back to that, um, is, uh, well, 36 months. So you lose three years because of air pollution. Luckily, the situation got better since 2000, but still, this is not a good sign. And we, don't, we still don't know exactly how bad particular matter or fine dust is really. This is based on PM10, which means it's, uh, it's everything up to 10 micrometers, uh, particles that are up to 10 micrometers, but there's also the PM2.5, which is even smaller uh, particular matter, and you even can go smaller to PM1, which is what we are going to measure, which is, uh, well, I'll come, come back to that as well in the next slide. Uh, they have different kinds of risks related to them. Uh, and Belgium is right in the center, and in the, in the more detailed maps, I, I, sh I think I have them as well, uh, you see that Ghent and Antwerp are the worst in the Western Europe. Um, I think it, Italy is also worse, and uh, Turkey and, and the, the uh, East European countries, there is also a lot more air pollution. But uh, in Western Europe, it's uh, Ghent and Antwerp that, uh, that uh, stick out. So, the type of pollu pollutants, obviously the particulate matter, you don't know what it is. It could be different kind of things. Some might be more uh, damaging than others to our body. But everything larger than PM10, everything larger than 10 micrometers, actually gets trapped by the body, usually. So thanks to nasal hairs, <laughs> thanks to other things like, like the slime in, 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 uh, in your airways, those bigger particles usually they get, uh, they get, uh, get out, either by coughing or things like that. But they usually don't get deep inside of your body. But everything smaller than, than 10 micrometers, um, you, can, you can inhale, they get into your lungs. 
And they get into, in, in the upper sides of the lungs, they don't go very deep, but they still get into your lungs. And they can stay into, in the air for a few hours. But because they're heavier, obviously, they, they settle more easily. But if you go smaller than, than PM10, like PM2.5, um, they, can, they can get into your lungs in the, in the locations where you do the gas exchange. So if they block the gas, ex the gas exchange, obviously, it, you get more problems breathing. So those are even more damaging. And then if you go to ultra-fine particles, which is actually smaller than one micrometers, but uh, usually it's, it's defined as uh, zero, uh, zero 0.01 uh, micrometers and smaller, they can even get into your bloodstream. So these are, they can be considered more dangerous, but obviously if you can't breathe anymore, it's uh, dangerous as well. And actually there's something nice to tell, why did we get, uh, th the project is called Adam, but the, the idea of doing this project in Timelab is because one of the, uh, the people that started Timelab uh, gave birth to a son who uh, unfortunately was born with, with a, a lung deficiency uh, where he was very, very uh, sensitive to air pollution. And this boy was called Adam. And so there's also a link to the project name Adam because of this. And that was the original idea that, uh, why we're doing this project. And if you look at the slide, um, you can see the different types of air pollution that could cause certain uh, particulate matter. For instance, pollen, um, which are a natural, it's a natural source of, of, of dust. Um, obviously, we can't do anything about that by changing the way we, we, we live. Um, but there are other types of, of, uh, of particulate matter like heavy dust, uh, settling dust. You have um, cement dust which is, which is uh, between 10 micrometers and uh, 1 micrometer. You have oil smoke, you have smog. Tobacco smoke is very small so you can see that if you smoke it can settle into your bloodstream. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you also have gases. Um, now, Ghent, uh, the most beautiful city in, in Europe, obviously, um, we have this, um, this student population, which is quite big in Ghent as well. I think in Eindhoven is the same, and the students, they use bikes a lot. Uh, so the idea that we have is let's use this, the fact that bikes are used a lot throughout the city as one of the ways to get air pollution information. Now, in Ghent we also have this. This is, uh, this is uh, the flyover in Ghent, which actually brings the, the highway directly into the city, um, which is obviously not good for air, air quality. And we live at the end, where the highway touches the ground again. That's where we live. So I'm also very affected by air pollution. Um, the thing is that this flyover usually is um, you, you, have, you have traffic jams, uh, sometimes the whole day, but usually in the morning and in the evening, which bring all those, uh, all those air pollution uh, matter in, into the air. Um, and so let's monitor what this is actually doing and what the effect is. Um, as I said, yeah, we, are, we have a lot of students. I think one, one out of five people during, during the week, no, one out of six is, uh, is a student. Lots of people using bikes. We have an industry in Ghent. Uh, we have the port of Ghent. Uh, both are known to be big sources of air pollution as well. And we have two highways around the city of Ghent as well, which is also part of the uh, air pollution. Um, as I already indicated, the official air pollution stations with fine dust meters, because there are also different other uh, air quality monitoring devices. But the two that we have that monitor fine dust, they are strategically placed to meet the European levels. And the European levels, like I said, the, 30, the, the first 35 values <laughs> that they measure, the 35 worst days, are scrapped from the, from the books. So they don't count for whatever reason. Um, also, they have this, uh, these norms for, for on a daily basis and they have this, these norms on a yearly basis. And that, that doesn't make sense. I mean, it's what you breathe in that makes sense, not whatever is the yearly uh, digit or the yearly number for, for, uh, for some particular pollutant. So that 
obviously they have to find a way to define it, but this doesn't really make sense. It's what you breathe in, and the, if you're taking some bike route, it, it's what route you take that makes effect to your body. So if we have this data, if we can make this data more valuable so that the numbers make more sense, then we can tell you which, which routes you can take. If you go from, from your home to your work, it's probably better to, to take, take this, uh, this route than the route you're normally using. That's what we want to be able to tell you. And obviously air quality is not just particulate matter, it's not just fine dust. It's, uh, it's just that fine dust is the least known variable today, but we know it's the most, uh, the most damaging, next to ozone probably. Um, luckily we have the, the, the Green Party in the City Council, so if we have this data, if we make this data public, maybe we can uh, have the, the, the official, how do you say it, the, the elected uh, people also take, take more, uh, take more um, concerns for this problem. Now, the interesting part, probably, that uh, is more interesting to you, this is, this is the device. Well, this is one of the early sketches of the device when we thought that uh, the, the pieces, the hardware pieces that we're going to use would be this. And it's almost, uh, this is almost how it looks like. We dropped the Bluetooth uh, device, which is, uh, if you can recognize it, it's there as well. Um, but there are some other things that we, we learned uh, by building. Because you can, you can design something, you can create it, and then obviously you learn a few things that, uh, that you want to do differently. Um, this is already, I already mentioned this. Well, there is something else. When we first created the design, um, we, we just made something work, but obviously what we wanted to do was to have something modular, because this de design is open, people can, can re-implement it, but maybe they want to use different components, so we wanted to make something that can be uh, modular, that you can just drop in drivers and it will automatically pick up a different driver for temperature or humidity or something like that, uh, or even different sensors, and that you can easily add it to your device. And that's how it is now. So um, I can show you maybe later how it, how it actually works. Uh, we also try to reuse, ob obviously reuse existing open source libraries, uh, which we can because it's open source. This is uh, the this is not the last design, this was the previous design. I can show you the last design uh, later. Um, and what you can see here, the, the big red one is uh, an ESP8266. Uh, Before we decided to use this, uh, this micro, uh, microprocessor, we wanted to use just Arduino and we had Bluetooth for um, uploading the, the data. But this device is actually much, much better because it's actually a Wi-Fi uh, chipset. It includes Wi-Fi on the main board and it also allows you to do Arduino well, it allows you to run your own code as well. Um, this device, unfortunately, does not have enough I.O. ports. And that's why we had to change the design once we knew what we wanted to do. Um, the problem is that the GPS uh, is a, is a, uh, has a serial interface. Our device has a serial interface as well, but we would prefer to use it for debugging and using the device. So we don't want to use the, the existing wart that is on the system for, uh, for communicating with the GPS. It, would, it would, wouldn't help us in, in, in the development process. So what we did was we used the software serial interface. You want to also not only read from the GPS, you also want to write to it because you want to be able to configure your GPS. Otherwise, it, it, uh, it gives you too much information, information we don't need, and we have to process that information as well because it's, it, it's, it's being sent to us. So, we don't have enough I.O. ports, so in the new design, and I don't know, uh, let me show it quickly. This is the new design. Uh, you can see that there is an, an additional component right here, which is, in, uh, is an Arduino Nano Pro, I think. Um, and this one, what, what we plan to do with it, we have a bus, I can show you here as well. Uh, so we have the microcontroller, we have the, um, the I2C uh, sensor, so we have a bus that, that with all the sensors, I can show you here as well. Um, 
at the bottom we use the 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 yeah the plus and min the the the, the, the electricity lanes for for powering all the, the, the devices. But on the top we use the, the electricity lanes actually for a for bus, for I square C bus. And that's where you see the, the black and white uh, lanes going to each device. And what we really wanted to have was a GPS, which was also an I square C device. But if you look at the costs of those devices, and actually this device does have I square C uh, uh, ports, but we can't use them. There is something going on that we that we why we can't use them. We don't know exactly. We, we couldn't make it work, and it's also hard to uh, solder that on on top of the device. And we still have to manufacture those devices, so it's it's going to be a big problem if we have to solder on top of the chips on the GPS. So. We have the microcontroller, we have a few sensors at the moment, we can add sensors later as well. We have a fine dust sensor, we have the accelerometer which allows us to check if we are moving on a bike um, or if we are standing still or we can also use it to uh, configure the device. For instance, if you shake it, it will go into some sort of configuration mode with a Wi-Fi access point and then you can log on to it and modify the, the configuration settings. For instance, tell it that it's a stationary device and not a moving device. If, you, if we're not putting it on a bike, but we put it in a house, we want to know that. If it's inside of the house or outside of the house, we want to know it as well, because if it's inside, we're not that interested in the information, because we don't know what you're doing. Are you cooking? Then you're also creating fine dust. So um, the accelerometer meter will help us with, with, uh, with certain things. You, we have the humidity sensor, because fine dust is also related. Like I, t like I said, the PM10, the, the, the bigger particles, they will stay in the, in the air for hours. The PM2.5 will stay in the air for a few days, po possibly. Uh, and even the smaller articles, they will stay in the air longer and they will easily move from city to city if there is wind. But if, obviously, if the humidity is high, the, the particles, they settle easier. The, if it rains, the, the, all the fine dust is gone, so rainy days are good for us. Um, so the humidity makes sense to also collect that information because it, there is a d d correlation with the, the fine dust as well. And we also have air pressure because air pressure also, uh, if you, you know that uh, wind settles uh, depending on the, the air pressure, so we want to know what the air pressure is when we make statistics. Um, and then we have the GPS, uh, which we, with the Arduino Pro Mini, so it's not a Nano, it's a Pro Mini, but I thought it was a Nano. Um, we, we, we use it actually as a conversion tool between the, the, the serial of the GPS and our own i square C bus. So we have a different code base. We have one code base for our microprocessor running on the ESP8266, and we have a second uh, microprocessor simply for converting between the i square c bus, so accepting specific commands and then returning GPS information or configuring the GPS. And we can use that additional microprocessor to also drive other stuff. If we in the future have other uh, sensors that are not i square c, um, uh, that doesn't have an i square c interface, we can add them there as well. And then we have some other I, uh, input or output devices, in this case uh, the, the, the LED uh, buzzer, because we want to make noise. So we want to give real-time feedback to the user, to give them uh, a sense. Otherwise they're, they're not probably going to take this device with them every time, they might forget it. But if they have real-time information, it's also useful for them when they're cycling, what the air quality is. And we were thinking of uh, maybe bird sounds, if. Uh, we, we don't know yet, but for instance, the, the logo that we have, you see that on the, on the right corner, it's a bird, and the reason why we took a bird is because in the coal mines, to detect if there were gases, gases they used uh, canary pitten <laughs> to, uh, do you say canary? I don't know. Yeah, you see canary. So we, they used canary birds to, uh, to, to see if, if the air quality was good enough. Uh, if one of those died, from digestion, everybody would uh, go out of the mines. Um, something specific to fine dust uh, sensors. We tested 
a lot of finders sensors and we even uh, bought ourselves a professional device it's this one it's a it's a dialos uh, dc 1100 pro um, to this one is calibrated the devices that we buy are calibrated by the company that sells them but the what they read is different than what this uh, calibrated device gives you as output so how does it work you can see here that there is a uh, uh, an infrared LED that emits uh, light, obviously, infrared light. You have a, 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 a photodiode, so something that detects the light. And then, obviously, the, the, there is intake of air. The air contains fine dust particles. They get, um, the light gets uh, reflected on those uh, particles and they get reflected directly into the photodiode, which detects and gives you a high or a low um, signal to, to and it, it gives you, well, based on the length of the signals, you know how many particles have passed. Or you can do some statistic analysis that gives you um, the number of particles that uh, passed your sensor. Uh, there's also a resistor that we're probably going to remove. And the resistor is used to ensure that air is heated and there is an automatic inflow uh, and, and, and flow through the device. But we're on a bike, so we don't really need it. If you're biking, there is automatically we can create, there is a technique where we create inflow um, and we will have automatic flow through our device. Obviously, there is one problem, there are multiple problems with this, but this is, uh, this is also used in this device, although this device uses a laser which is uh, more effective in measuring the, the fine dust. But this device costs, I think, 300 euros. The device that we are buying costs 15 euros. So we have to make something that is cheap. And even though it may not be as good in, in sensing the information, that's why we want to collect as much information as we can by having as much of those devices uh, biking through the city. Because if we have a few of, the, of those devices, or we calibrate a few of our own devices, and people pass our device, we can calibrate them a bit. But if we have enough of those devices driving around with all this data, and we use big data techniques, we can um, enhance the information we get. We can make uh, offsets between devices because they're not calibrated. We have to see how much they, they fluctuate with real numbers. And we can take into account the temperature, the humidity, um, the, the, the air pressure to see what the effect is and how these uh, numbers add up and, and, and compare to each other. And so we can improve our information but also make the raw data available so that scientists can also look at that and maybe improve on that as well. But then we, at least we have information. Now we don't have any information of those uh, of, of the, the air quality throughout the city. When we started, when I started, because I only started at the beginning of this year and the project was already running for, uh, I think, another year, um, the first thing I did was I took all the code that was already written because we had a lot of code written to test each of the sensors, to test the, the air quality, well, the, the, the fine dust sensor. The first thing I did was I want to integrate everything because I want to see what the final product, how it will work. And so I came up with a state uh, machine that looks like this. Um, the state machine, actually the colors that you see is actually the color of the LED. So that if we turn it on, we can easily see in what state it is. Even if, we're not, if we do not have a serial device connected to it to see the output. And so when we start, we automatically go into sleep mode. We initialize all the sensors, we go into sleep mode. But if, I don't know if it's readable for you because it is not for me. <laughs> Let me come to the front. Ah. So, we go into the sleep mode, and in sleep mode, we, if we are moving, we go into a GPS test mode, I called it, which is actually testing if we have GPS data. If we have GPS data, and we are still moving, we go to collect mode. In the collect mode, we get the information, we put it in a buffer. Uh, at the moment, it's just a buffer of the, the microprocessor, but the intention is to have an I2C uh, memory uh, device added as well, where we put in the information. The interface is defined, so it's easy to swap uh, the current implementation with the I2C uh, memory. And so we, st we start collecting, 
um, until we are not moving or we don't have GPS information. Obviously, if we don't know where we are, the information is no longer relevant, uh, the sensor information. So if you go under a bridge, we may get that information a little bit, but then if the, after 30 seconds we don't have any GPS data, we probably will stop with collecting information. Um, if we go back, if, if we're no longer moving, we automatically go back to sleep. And if we're in sleep, from time to time we will check, do we have Wi-Fi? If there is something in the buffer. So if only if we have information in the buffer, we will check if there is a Wi-Fi access point that we know about. If that is the case, we'll have, and we have a Wi-Fi fix, we will upload the information. If all that information is finished, we, the buffer is empty, we go back to sleep. So it's very, very simple. And then if we're in sleep, and we, we know that someone is shaking the device, for instance, we go into the yellow light, the, the LED becomes yellow, we, have, we start the Wi-Fi access point, you can connect to it, you can configure the device, you can add Wi-Fi, uh, other Wi-Fi access points that are used here, because you might have one at work, you might have one at home, and if you're cycling and you come at work, it will automatically, if you put it at rest, it will automatically send, up the, infor uh, send the information to our servers, that's the, the ID. And this is already working, so that's, uh, I can show you later uh, how it works. But I may have to upload a new firmware. <laughs> so, you know already a lot of the device, uh, what do I have to say as well? It's Arduino based, but I don't like the Arduino framework myself. But since we have some developers who use Windows, we have to still uh, make sure that that works. And we also want to ensure that other people that want to work on the project can do it with the Arduino IDE. But we are using a make file that just calls the, the, the necessary stuff. We are also using uh, Platform IO, so it also works in Platform IO and actually uh, our Travis CI uses Platform IO for checking if the code works when you check in new stuff. Um, so code read readability is a key, that's why we have this uh, state machine implemented. The, if you read through our main pro program, it, it reads very, very, it, it's easy to read. You don't have to understand everything to know what's going on because all the complexity obviously is in the libraries, the sensor libraries and the, the functional libraries uh, that we need. Um, so we have simple state machine with state transitions. Uh, what happens if you go from one state to the other? It will do some, some stuff as well. And if it is in a certain state, it loops through that state and through the, through the state machine code, of, obviously. Um, yeah, I think I, I mentioned everything. We also take care that we have small test examples for individual drivers because we have had issues, especially if you work with those, uh, with those uh, uh, cables that, that are sometimes loose and stuff like that. You often have things that doesn't appear to be working and then it's nice to be able to test an, an individual isolated uh, device with a small test program that you know that worked before. Now, there are a lot of nice ideas and, and if I do these presentations, a lot of people come up with new ideas, so I'd like to hear from you what, uh, what you would do or some, some, something creative. Um, but obviously we first want to have this uh, minimal viable product, which we have now and we're going to create a PCB very soon. Um, but these are the things that came up before. So, uh, one of the one of our partners were very interested to be able so the it's it's the, an organization that um, you know those organizations that that care for bikers one of those organizations is very interested to have the state of the of the the, the, the of the roads for bikes and so if we could collect bumps and we see that multiple bikes have the same bumps then we can maybe give that information, extract that out of there, give it to them, and so they can make sure that the, the roads are better, or they can at least check it out. Um, we want to add, obviously, more air quality sensors in the future. Um, we, there's a lot of requests for having uh, stationary devices, because if you want to, if you know what the air pollution is outside and inside, you can use that information to know when do I have to open the windows to, 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 to clean the air inside of the house. Because if the air is outside is worse than inside, don't open the windows. 
but you don't know at the moment and you don't you can you cannot trust the device that is somewhere in the city that will tell you because air pollution is it matters where you are it matters how the wind blows it matters if it has rained so open your windows after it has rained or during it raining that's the best time uh, to open windows don't do it in the evening because you think there are no cars anymore no more on the road uh, the traffic jams are stopped because the like i told you the air quality stays in, in the the, the uh, Particulate matter stays in the air for a longer period of time, and in the evening, especially during the winter, people turn on their their the temperature in the house, and there is a lot of air pollution from gas burning, from from oil, uh, from from uh, heating, central heating systems. So that's probably not the best time to 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 turn on the to, to open the windows. So more information, the more we know and the better we can take actions. Um, like I already said, but this is something we go, we're going to do in the back end, is we want to calibrate those devices automatically when we pass other bikers that have a better trusted information because they passed uh, a calibrated device for instance, we can automatically centrally do these calculations to improve our uh, information. Um, People were thinking about creating a mobile app so that people that are running can also see without having to, to wear some massive device, well it's not going to be massive but at least hindering when you're, when you're uh, running, maybe an app could tell you this is the way to go. This is the, the, at this time this is the way to go because it's time based as well, it's location based. Um, correlating air quality to sources and weather conditions obviously at some point in time we may be able to say ah the wind is coming from this side at this this time we know in advance what the air pollution will be it's a holiday okay we know what the air pollution will be based on previous uh, previous sensor data and obviously to make to create more awareness we could create billboards and we have been talking with partners to use billboards that are not being used commercially, uh, to use them for showing air quality. If you're at a bus station, why not show the, the air quality information there, the real-time air, air quality information. If you're in a traffic jam, why not put some sign that says, this is the air quality here, where you're, what you're producing, this is the air quality. Might help, because inside of the car it won't be a, a lot better. Um, so these are all the things that we can do. So how can you help? We are looking for people. Obviously, you're not from Ghent. We can still uh, use your help. Um, we can help people that want to. Uh, we can use the help from people that want to learn how to develop on embedded platforms. Because at the beginning of this year, I never did these kind of things. I knew a little bit of, of Arduino, and obviously, I could program. But this was a whole new world for me, and I learned a lot. So you can learn a lot as well if you want to help out. You can do some some similar project in your city if you would like to. Um, you can visual, well, we, we, we're still looking for people to visualize the real-time sensor data because the backend is not yet implemented. We have something that collects data, but it's not doing anything with it and it's only on a small scale at this moment, but this will grow. So we're looking for people who want to help with that. Um, once we have the device, we're looking for people that want to help install the device. There will be a little soldering going on and, and putting the device together and train the users how to use them and create awareness. So these are all the things that uh, we're looking people for, for helping. And we come together once a month to have progress meetings. We come together once a week for the device team, which is I'm part of. And uh, we don't expect people to have prior knowledge because we can explain everything. We can run you, we can go through the code and the code is quite easy to understand. And if you go to the GitHub project, you can see the code and you can see how easy it is. I don't know how much time I have left. I see that I have still 10 minutes left, which is nice because I have some additional slides if you're interested. Or maybe we should go to questions and then I can get those slides. I, I was told to give you the microphone because otherwise... Uh... Yes, okay, that's good. Then I can talk <laughs> as long as I want. Uh, my <laughs> name is Diederik and uh, I think you have a really cool project and there's for the past few years a lot has been going on about citizen science and measuring air quality so it's a very popular topic but it's also a very tough one to tackle and i would recommend you to be 
uh, to see if you can already do some tests about what you're actually measuring. Uh, because I think the air quality egg, which of course you know, and it's a famous example that completely fell apart because they also thought, oh, our sensors are not as good, but we have a lot of data. And when you do some big data analysis and some algorithms, and then it will all be fine. But it wasn't fine because uh, the air quality act is to measure like in your outside of your house, so attach it to the wall or something. And there was a big influence if you put it like this or like this, or was it in the sun or not. And even though you can say you can filter the mistakes out with big data and stuff, that didn't work at all. So I'm really curious if you already have some ideas or thinking about that, or else just uh, see if you can tackle that early on. We have discussed internally a lot of the things that could go wrong like um, those examples you gave, we, we have those examples in Belgium as well, um, where you cannot conclude certain things out of the information you get. Now, the thing is, obviously, those devices, we're first going to do it with a small group of people. We have selected 40 or 50 people to test the devices, to, to see how they work in real, real life, uh, to see what they measure, to compare it with calibrated devices. And obviously, we do it step by step. Right? We're not going to have thousands of those devices. Hmm? Do, we have do we have scientists in our team? We, uh, we do have people from, uh, with those backgrounds uh, that, are re that are in the project, but since we don't have the data yet, they're not involved yet. So we have, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, organizations that are, uh, that are concerned with health that are interested in this. For instance, there's one organization that is interested to see what our data and the, um, the information they have on uh, patients with, with lung uh, diseases, they want to see if there is a relation be between where people live or where people are with the information we gather as well. But those things are only relevant if the information is of a high enough quality or useful. And so I agree with you that the uncertainty in this project is how good the, the information is. And we'll have to see just by doing what we can do with it. Because a lot of those things, even the device we have, it's based on, so, so the numbers we get out of the device, because it's cheap, it's based on um, how well it's calibrated and the statistical information, well, the statistical, um, the numbers we get, it's based on statistics. Because it only measures uh, how long there was something before the lens, and so that's, you have, to, you have to get information out of that, and so that's statistics. Also, the, going from the number of particles to the, how many micrograms it is, because that's what all the health organizations use as the metric. So we have to also use statistics for that. And we can also only get those statistics based on calibrated devices. So we, we, there's, there are a lot of studies that go from, that have a formula from going from one to the other and it depends on the outside, uh, the, the humidity, it depends on temperature and so we can only implement it if, if we can also trust that information and only if it is really the same for us as it is in the US because that, th those informations are from the US. Uh, also find us, like I said, it includes pollen and other kind of information so it might not be a good metric for for air quality, because if there are more pollen in the lucht, then uh, <laughs> we have a problem with that as well. So, I agree with you, but if we don't have any data, it's worse than having data, which we know that might be wrong, and we can find out why we're not getting the information we expect. And it, that's the science, eh? <laughs> so let's hope we can, we can do it, yeah. Yes. Um some 50 years ago, I worked at the Philips uh, Physical Laboratories and um, there was a time that um, I had, as, as a young boy, to uh, do research on, uh, on why certain things were not possible to make. And at one time I said it was the dust. So then everyone said, um, well, we, we, this is what we always thought but never told and this young guy comes here and he tells us what it is. From that time on, uh, Philips uh, made um, a dust-free laboratory, a class 100 at that time, and uh, as a young boy, I was one of the four who designed it. So I can say that my interest for um, uh, dust and aerosols, it was called at that time, is already 50 years, something like that. The literature is enormous. 
and the dangers are not yet known. In my imagination, um, these fine particles can even go to the DNA and damage there. And that still has to come out for the small child in the future and no one knows what it will be. So, uh, in my imagination, this is a terrible consequence. What I use, what I miss here in this, um, I appreciate this very much. Uh, I would like to be involved, uh, so to say. Um, what I miss here is that um, the small things people can do in their homes. So I have a, a lot of um, uh, plants which um, suck up the air and clean the air. And uh, it's well known. Uh, if you find, uh, if you go and search on the internet, you can do that. Uh, um, and um, also, um, it, what I miss here is um, uh, other things like uh, the gases in the in the one. For example, um, it's very well known that in the air there is a much of a lot of copper, and it's uh, it's in the part per billions. Uh, which I measured myself a long time ago. That is very dangerous. Um, I myself uh, had some experience in, in Brugge, Brugge. Uh, a long time ago. There was uh, a factory from Bayer and at that place, and the, the cows. In, uh, let me first say that I, I entered the, the factory of Philips in, in Brugge. And I saw that the windows were not clean enough. They were a kind of haze was over it. So I said, uh, how is it that these Belgians don't wash their windows? They were, of course, insulted. Huh? <laughs> I was too young to, to realize that. But um, it came out that um, nearby was a factory of Bayer. And um, they had some action there. And then the cows in the surrounding they all went through their, um, to, to their knees because they, they couldn't cope yeah. anymore. Yeah. And also this kind of uh, fluor uh, was on the windows. So it's not only um, the air, it's, 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 it's enormous. I mean, you, you can see on the outside of buildings uh, mm. all these kind of things. It's so much that I, I have no words for it. And people don't believe it. Yeah. What they don't see, they don't believe. Yeah. That is indeed the problem with air pollution. Eh? You don't see it often, and you, you're breathing it. If you're drinking water, you can select the water you drink. If you're eating, you can select the water you eat, but you cannot select the air you breathe. And that's, the, that's, the, that's very important. And I agree with you that um, we're only measuring dust and fine dust. We're not measuring possibly the things that we would be willing to measure, but we have to be able to do it within a certain amount of money. I mean, I can show you, well, let me, let me quickly go through um, the other slides. This is how much the device now costs without bulk, uh, bulk prices. So we expect this, this price to drop to half of this amount. And you can see what is the, what is the most expensive. Well, it's the microcontroller, but that one can go down as well. The fine dust meter, that's probably going to be the hardest and is the most expensive one in bulk as well. So, if we would be able to measure metals, uh, specific metals in the air, I don't know how to do it and it's probably going to be a, a hell of a, a device. It's going to be probably, it has to be uh, like they do with, um, how is it called, uh, dry, dry, they first get the air, they, they dry everything, they get the air out and everything that's left over, then they can, they can do with microscopes, look at what, the, what, what is inside of it, or they can do some scientific tests to see what's in them. But that you cannot do on a, on a massive scale. You cannot do it in real time. That's the problem for most of the, the things that, are, that we would like possibly, which we know where the health effects are, but they are very hard to measure. And so, if you see that this, this sensor, and this is the cheapest sensor, it gave the best results for this price. There is also the PPD60, which has two, um, two sensors in it. So it has one um, infrared diode, uh, uh, LED, but it has, oh, it has two sensors to, to get better information. And this one already cost, I think, 120 euros or something. 
So, and then you have a much better one with lasers, which are more expensive even so. The fact that these are quite uh, cheap is that these devices are used in aircrow systems. So they can be easily replaced inside of aircrow systems uh, and they're used to also detect the air quality within, within buildings. Um, but we have to work with what we can measure cheaply unfortunately. And I hope that things will get better, we can get better sensors. It's like the radiation sensors after what happened in Fukushima. Radiation sensors or better radiation sens sensors became cheaper because there was a, a lot of people that wanted them and so uh, the industry followed. The GPS is also quite expensive. Um, so that's one of the things. Uh, but uh, the more we can measure the better obviously. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think you have a really cool project, and I was looking around at your website, and um, it's it's really awesome. Um, but one thing you said uh, worries me a little bit, and this whole project has some some sort of a, a fishing trip, um, 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 yeah, ambience around it, um, because you said um, it's better to have data, any data, than no data at all, and. Um, you also you also said there are some scientists involved, um, not really committed yet. So, um, and I disagree with you that having data, uh, any data, is better than no data at all. I think um, data you can't trust, but you have trust in, is far worse than having no data at all. I agree with that. So the wording may have, have uh, confused you, maybe. But I think it's better to have the raw data available that scientists can look at and that we can figure out why we get this data and how, how, uh, how trustworthy it is than having no data. Now we don't have any data and we don't know. And we only get some numbers from the government or some numbers from, from the EU and we don't know how they get there and if it's trustworthy and we don't know how it affects us in, as individuals or as I said, at what time, at what location. And so I think if we have raw data available, scientists can look at it. Um, we can look if the device is, is working properly. We can, at least we have something to work on. So I agree with you that having data may not be better than having no data, but at least we have something to work from and we can improve it. I don't say if we have data, we have to trust it. That's not, obviously not what I'm saying. That's, uh, so if you trust, Worthless data, then it's worse, obviously. And do you have any idea how valid your data is going to be in this setup, on a bike, with this sensor, uh, etc.? We're working on it. So I, I'm testing it at home with the, with the calibrated device and we're working on it. Yeah. We first have to make this device We have to before we can test it in the wild. Because now, with, like I said, with those cables and with those, there are too many noise that we cannot, uh, we first have to make it more trust, trustworthy. Hi, thank you. I want to ask you some question about, I don't know if you mentioned, like, which is the limit of, uh, the, limit of the law about uh, the air pollution? about uh, this uh, dust yeah. and other things is, if I discover that I live in a house where there is, a, for example in Gantt, uh, there is like high concentration of this uh, dust, I can denounce like uh, the, the government or I can le legally I can act because it can be a problem. I don't know for the legal part. I don't know how you can uh, how you can do that. Uh, it depends probably on the on the country as well. But I can show you what the the different. Well, this is one of the things that we plan to use f for getting air intake. It's a uh, it's a uh, physics. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to say it in, in English. But this is what is what we're planning to use to get to ensure we have air intake when we're uh, on the road. Um, so, there are different projects, so we're not looking at this isolated. We have, uh, we have looked at f uh, different existing uh, projects. And like uh, we were talking about the, the, the metal, uh, metal particles in the air, there was in, uh, in Antwerp, there was a, a project where they had 700 uh, strawberry plants and they wanted to see how much of those uh, metal was inside of the plants when they started and then after a few months. 
Uh, but obviously what they had to do was they has, had to crush the plants and, and then look at what the residue of, of those plants to see how much metal they took from the air, which is something that you cannot do in real time. Uh, so, but there are a lot of other projects. There is one in, in, in Zurich which is still ongoing where they also are measuring uh, the air quality on top of trams. So you probably have some, uh, some numbers that are probably influenced by the trams themselves. Here you have a better map, but this is PM10, uh, and I think this was in 2005. And you can see here, you can see on the map clearly Ghent and Antwerp, for instance. So uh, that's why I wanted to show you this as well. Um, what, we are tr we, what we are planning to measure with our sensor is PM1. Because we have the information, the sensor gives us, gives us the number of particles for PM2.5 and, and PM1. And so what we plan to do is to measure the, num the, the particles between PM1 and PM2.5. And so that we know exactly those sizes, what, they, what effect they have. And then these are the air, European air quality standards. And like I said, uh, there are permitted exceedings in Europe for PM10. 35 permitted exceedings every year. So it's, it's, a, it's a strange number. And the, the air quality, the, what, you, what you are allowed to have in 24 hours is 200 micrograms, which is, which is a strange, uh, high, highly number. Um, and over, well, in a year it's 40 micrograms. And it's, uh, it's the average, obviously, so that doesn't really make any, any sense in this case. There's also the World Health Organization, which has lower numbers. <laughs> so it's really strange that Europe chose 200, while um, the, uh, the World Health Organization chose uh, 50. So, <laughs> and then it's 35, and then even at 200, so yeah. Uh, there were two new questions. Let me quickly. Ah, this this is the last slide, so I can. I want to answer. Um, yeah. Uh, the point. Yeah. Uh, one should mention milieu defensie. Uh, Anne Knol here in the Netherlands, with some other groups from milieu defensie. They have um, um, written a letter to our um, government, and there was no success. So now they are going to bring a lawsuit. And I don't know how it's, how it's with that lawsuit. So, but it's difficult. Yep. There was another question. Yeah. It's already 10 past one, and I don't know who the next speaker is, but I don't see him here. Okay. Or um, maybe there's a pause now. Time. I don't know. Well, I, I just quickly uh, shoot my uh, question or comments. Yeah, yeah. One, uh, you mentioned that uh, this open source hardware. I found this interesting project, and since uh, probably a month ago, somebody sent an email to um, a mailing list of MedSpace in Eindhoven and mentioning this project. And I browsed a, a website, but I cannot find uh, even the, the list of components that use. I mean, um, it should be available somewhere The um, uh, if on a GitHub or somewhere? It is schematic. on GitHub. GitHub, okay. Yeah. Another? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, w about Wi-Fi, uh, you try to, um, how do you call it, to turn off the resistor to save some power. Um, you probably have heard about it, uh, Laura Network, that's a citizen network for Internet of Things, and we are busy now in Eindhoven to uh, rolling out uh, this network that probably can save some problem because uh, Wi-Fi, uh, needs to, uh, well, you say that uh, you need to save data and send it afterwards, so that's not real uh, real time. And LoRaWAN can offer you uh, and probably uh, uh, with with less energy as well. Okay, yeah, but you you can also calibrate the all the tool through the, this network, or Wi-Fi or LoRaWAN, so the calibration can be like live. Uh, we do not plan to calibrate the device itself over the network. The plan is to calibrate the data afterwards based on big data. So, uh, but the question was, where did, can you find that information? I can show you maybe the, the GitHub repository. The only problem is I cannot see my screen and that screen unless I change the settings to mirror. Um, yeah, that's it. Now you should, should see what I'm seeing. I, 
you can say yes, but obviously that doesn't. Do you see my screen? Not yet? Black. It's black. I, and I don't see black, obviously. Uh, maybe I should go to a lower resolution. Does this help? It stays black? Uh, yeah. Go to the GitHub. GitHub is, uh, well, I can show you that. Um, so, on the GitHub there is a doc directory and it contains the, 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 the list of materials. Um, let me see if I can... Yeah. And then the other question that you had was related to uh, the, the LoRa network. Uh, we looked at that as well, but the problem is that the amount of information we can send over the LoRa network was um, limited. Uh, oh, I don't know what happened here, now it's completely full screen. Um, but the LoRa network was limited in information we could send and uh, it's not available everywhere in Belgium and you have to subscribe to it so it costs money. So. We think that the device we're creating now, even though it's not real-time, and real-time would be useful, but it's not that useful. I think if we have the information, we still have to do the analysis of that information as well. So we're not there to give you useful real-time information anyway at this moment. But at least the components we're using is something that they can use everywhere in the world. Uh, and that was our first concern. We wanted to create something that other projects are interested in as well. And in Antwerp and in Brussels, they are very interested in what we're doing in the project as well. So, so we're, I'm very confident that we will have scientists in this project once we have this device working and we have information. I think the, getting the information is very tempting for scientists. And a lot of the projects where they did something like this, the information they collected was very limited because the scientists are much more interested in doing something with the numbers than acquiring the numbers because that requires technical people getting the devices out, creating the right device and stuff like that. So if you look at the existing projects that exist in the US, um, they, are using ob they are using those devices inside of a box uh, with a serial connector to get information on three or four different locations that's not the scale that we are looking at. And so I think if we have the data, it becomes very interesting for scientists, data scientists, as well as um, health uh, scientists the, to, to, to work with us. And maybe improve our data, improve uh, the statistics behind it, and so on. So uh, let's finish this, <laughs> this presentation because we will run out over the, the dedicated time for it. Thank you.